today I'm gonna to show you how to go from this to this. If you wanna get footage like this, And stay tuned because today I'm going to show you how to turn this 2015 Porsche Macan S into a camera car slash chase car. This can be done to almost any vehicle. Uh, you just need a few things. I'm not doing the Tilta Hydra Alien setup. That is a suction cup mount. Me personally, I wanted something that I felt uh, was a bit more secure that I didn't need to ratchet strap down. And I wanted something that, you know, I could just trust out on the highways at any speed. And I wanted it to be able to do either a front mount or a rear mount, depending on the needs and on the shots that I wanted to accomplish. So stay tuned as we build out this car and I'll show you everything that you need to get started in building a chase car camera car today. Now, when building a camera car setup, there, there's many ways you can do it. I wasn't sure how far down the rabbit hole I wanted to go. So I went and uh, I went, you know, quality on some pieces. I went more just um, non-specialty and other. The main thing when building a camera car though is that it is safe. You are putting a vehicle on the road with things attached to it that if you do not do it properly can fall off. And if there's a motorist, a motorcyclist, anybody behind you, you do not want to cause physical harm, bodily harm, any harm. So today I'm going to show you how to build a, a camera car um, a, in, the, in a cheap way, but also um, in a safe way, because if you're going to do this, do not skimp out on safety. You can build a camera car with things like suction cup mounts. You can build them with speed rail and use these types of clamps to hold everything together. Uh, the They are both safe in their own regard. If you ever build something with a suction cup mount, you have to ratchet strap it to the vehicle, to a point on the frame, through the roof, some way that is just guaranteed that if something catastrophic happens, that, they, that your rig is not gonna hit the ground. The reason I went with a speed rail build versus suction cups is because I just I just didn't want to worry about, about having that happen. And so um, it is a bit more expensive, but for me, it is more robust. It is it is just much easier and safer. And when I'm traveling at 80 miles an hour shooting another car, uh, that's the last thing I really want to uh, to worry about. In the industry, to do it correctly, you should actually go through your roof into the frame and into a, a structure that is not a crossbar like this. In the budget setup, this has been safely used by many people who have done this for years. It is not the most ideal, but it has been used at 140 miles an hour by Jacob and them from Golden Peaks Productions. So um, I think they've tested it out fairly well. Again, you can always play it safe and ratchet strap it to the, to the, to the vehicle. I just go with this and uh, I'm using these truss clamps, right? So these hold railing it's typically used whenever you're you're building scaffolding and they have the joints that i showed you before which are two joints that are locked together but they also sell joints or they also sell them that just have one single mount point and there's a a, a screw that goes through and for me to be able to attach it to this the screw wasn't long enough so what i did is i took the screw that came with it I went to the local hardware store and I matched up the correct thread with um, with the correct length that I needed. And I brought this with me to make sure it would fit. I measured the width of the bar that I needed it to go through. And then I came and got this Evo, took it off the car and I drilled a hole so that the screw could go through the Evo and then attached to the other side. So I got washers on this side with a lock nut. And so this thing is not going anywhere. Um, I have it for each side here. And I, I was trying to find this solution when I was looking 
and everybody was trying to come up with you know different ways that were just going to be way too hard or cost way too much money i already had this it had been used in the past so if you get these which i'll link in the description they are by a company called global trust america it is sold at b and h each one depending is between 25 to 40 bucks and um, while there are other companies that sell them they can tend to be much more expensive and so uh, these, while they aren't as um, streamlined or pretty as some of the other options on the market, they are what I was able to afford uh, in the budget that I set aside for this build. So I'm gonna go ahead and install the roof racks on the car with the truss clamps here, and then uh, we'll, we'll start the build. So what I what I like about the uh, the wing bar Evo system is that you don't have to have factory roof rails uh, on your car to be able to put cross uh, beams on your car. However, because it does attach right here in the door jam, you do just get a little bit of that wind noise at highway speeds. It's not overly annoying, but it is there. Just something to know about. All right, so now that I have my base with the uh, the roof racks, I, I'm gonna go ahead and put some, some rails up. Because I am going to the front and to the rear, so I have multiple uh, mount options, it matters where I place these because I've measured it out. I know how much rail I need to get from the top point of contact in the front to the tip of the car, and I know how much I need to get from the rear point of this rail to the back of the car. Those are important measurements because, yes, you can chop this rail down uh, once you get it, but you can't extend it. And if you do, it becomes a little bit more dangerous uh, just because you're adding more points of contact, which is more points of failure. So um, if you're just going to the rear or just going to the front, um, it, it doesn't matter where you kind of put this along, along your, uh, your roof rails. Uh, the most important thing, though, is that when you're making uh, your connections is that they are as wide as possible on the car because what we're doing is we're creating a base, right? We're creating a rail that's as far on the exterior of this side and on that side. And then two more rails are going to come off each one of those points and they're going to meet in the one's going to meet in the front and one's going to meet in the back. And what that's doing, those two points that are coming together is now creating a triangle. It's the strongest shape. So... We are trying to make a triangle with these speed rails and let's go. Oh, and I also just want to note that I have pre-marked on the rails where they should sit on the clamps that way when I'm building it in the future, I, I'm not having to guess where it goes. This way I can build it much quicker. Um, and, and one other thing is that I'm not gonna tighten everything completely down as I build, you know, just because you want a little bit of, of wiggle room. The only thing for me that I like to do personally, I like to make sure that when I'm tightening, that I leave the, the wing nut up here, I leave it offset. And that lets me have a visual cue that that is not torqued to spec so that if I was going to take this vehicle out for a, a ride to know that, hey, I need to lock that down. It is not safe. So behind me, I have the rails on the vehicle uh, ready to set up to create our triangles to the front and to the rear. They're finger tight just enough so that it, the rails will not spin or rotate or move. Um, but we need to find a place in the front of the vehicle to mount our, uh, our, our, our speed rail up here so that it can connect. Almost every vehicle is going to have a tow hook mount. So you're just going to find a circular uh, piece of plastic in the front of your car that looks you know different. You push on it and that's where the tow hook attaches. Just look in the back of your vehicle for um, your uh, you know, roadside emergency kit and that's where you're gonna find typically the tow hook. You're gonna take the half clamp that we put on top of the rail, um, on top of uh, the uh, tool rail up there. 
and we're going to create a custom mount. And so what we're doing is we're going to have the clamp. There's going to be some washers. There's going to be the actual tow hook, some more washers, and then a lock nut. Um, and so that is where the vertical for the front is going to come off of. They do make tow hook mounts that are specifically made with a piece of speed rail already on it so that you don't have to do what I'm about to do. It's another 150 bucks or so just for that mount. When I was doing all of this, you know, I was trying to do it for as affordable as possible. And, and I've seen many people that are very successful mounting it off of the tow hook because you're going straight into the frame. Um, and as long as your washers are thick enough and you are torqued tight enough, then you should be fine. So like I said, every vehicle typically has a sort of circular cutout in their bumper. If you just push at the top of it, you see how it wants to sort of just come out. Um, most of them have a little safety clip that's attached into the bumper. You just kind of squeeze and, and pull it out. Um, but as I said, we took the tow hook and we attached the half clamp to it using some thick washers, a lock nut, right? So once this thing is screwed in, this thing is on there extremely well. It's not gonna go anywhere. And all you have to do is thread it in. and you are ready to put a piece of vertical speed reel up. <laughs> Not everybody's tow hook will land perfectly um, vertical to where the speed reel automatically goes up. If that's the case, then you would just get your tow hook into a horizontal position. You would put a piece of reel horizontally, and then you would take one of the swivel clamps and just clamp it here and then go up from there. And you'd create your vertical off of the horizontal rail. And it's okay if your tow hook isn't all the way as tight as it will go. If it backs out a quarter turn, it's already so many threads deep, it's not going anywhere, it's, it's into your frame. Um, I am just fortunate that mine goes to a uh, vertical 90. What you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna take your piece of speed rail and typically it's longer, right? So when I first got it, mine, I just rested on the ground and then I just clamped it in. And it was, you know, it was six feet tall. And that way, you know, I didn't have to hold in the air. Once I got my build fully dialed in, I then just marked where I wanted it to, to get cut off at the bottom. And then I just used a regular saw with a general purpose blade, wood cutting blade. It sounds crazy, but it's aluminum and it cuts through it like butter, just wear uh, safety goggles, wear some glasses and just put it in like a vice grip, something that just, you know, doesn't allow it to move and just take take your time. I literally used one of those like hand saws uh, or the, you know, the sort of the saws that you just are free moving. It's better if you have one that you can just pull down to cut a nice even cut. Um, when you're done, just take a file and, and, and shave off the sharp edges. It was honestly very simple, but since, since this is pre-cut and since I know where these, um, clamps clamp on this, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and install it like this, but I will show you how and why I clamp these, um, so that you're not wondering how I got to this point. When building this out for the first time, it's much easier to have a second set of hands. The reason being is because, especially if you're coming off something like a tow hook mount like this, it's it's just a threaded um, access point, right? So like, if this were to have enough weight and lean this way, it would crash. And we don't want anything crashing, especially if there's another car nearby, or if it falls and it happens to fall the wrong way and hit, hit something else. So for me, I already know that it's locked, it's safe there. This isn't all the way clamped down because you know I'm gonna want to twist this uh, to make sure that the poles coming off of the center point are gonna meet here properly. 
But now that we have this here, we can use those uh, other speed rails to create our triangle. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So as I said, we're gonna wanna connect uh, and make our triangle. So these swivel clamps up here, they, it's, it, it moves freely. And so because it moves freely, there's that little bit of play I talked about earlier, right? There's just a little bit of just, just movement that will cause rattles over time. Uh, it's also just not as secure. So when I'm making this connection, there's actually something I might want to do is, is before I go to tighten it, instead of just leaving the two joints to where they're just freely moving, I'm going to want to twist it to where the two plates in the middle, instead of being like this, one's pushing against the other. And because when you twist just a little bit and it pushes against the other, it stops that rattle and now it's a firm connection. So I'm gonna put this in. And with, with these mounts, you can go ahead and set the bar and wing nut over so that it is just already there. It's not hanging loose so that the rail can rest freely. And I'm gonna do the same over here. I'm just gonna get this there. So now I can just feed this through and go all the way over there. So you, this point you wanna be careful. Like I said, it's, it's easier to have a second set of hands, but at any point, if you let go of this without it being tightened, this rail can and will fall. It can hit your paint and it can cause you a big headache, especially if it's not your vehicle. So we're gonna pull this and I'm pulling it with also being cautious that I don't pull it all the way through because I have this held up with my hand. That is being supported by that clamp over there. If I pull it too far, it's coming out of that clamp and going right on my windshield. All right, so you'll notice right here that I just have a little bit, maybe a centimeter of the rail coming out. So I'm gonna go ahead and lock down on that. I've already clamped this portion here so that when this tube pushed in, it was actually a little bit hard. Um, and, and I needed to, to open this up a bit because when I clamped down, I want it to be just off of 90 degrees. That way, like I said, this joint right here is being compressed. If it was at a, comp at a full 90, this wouldn't compress and I wouldn't get rid of the imperfections of this rail. Also, this joint here, and these clamps in particular can be locked and you want to lock them for the connections of the triangle at the verticals at the front and rear. And what I mean by that is there's a pin here and there's a pin here. So when, when the product ships, they are free moving swivels. There's, there's nothing to keep these from twisting. This thing, this whole piece right here will just spin and spin and spin if I twist it. When you know that you're going to put this at a 90 degree angle, it comes with a pin that you insert and then you have to hammer it in there. What that does is it prevents it from spinning like it is. See how it's locked, it won't spin? That is crazy important because that is the, the safety net that you have for these. If these start to swivel over time, then bad things can happen. By having these or a better clamp system, it is going to be much safer in the future. Just like we did that side, I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that this clamp is already ready for me to slide a rail in. And same with this, I'm gonna make sure that this one is good for me to slide a rail in. For the rear, if you don't have a trailer hitch mount, you may have a rear tow hook. If so, you're just gonna do what we did in the front with the tow hook. If you're lucky enough to have a trailer hitch mount, you're going to want to run your vertical off of that because that's attached to your frame. The issue with some mounts, like mine, 
the trailer hitch mount is underneath my bumper. So even with the, the ball extender that goes on right here, I would still hit my bumper. And also, if the arm is coming off of this close to your car, it's going to be hard if you're panning with the vehicle to see around each side of your bumper. <laughs> so having a trailer hitch extender that it can extend and get your arm further off of your rear will help you tremendously in filming. Also, you have to just be cognizant that there's laws in, in, in the US, three feet off the front, four feet off the rear, anything further has to have flags and or other sort of warning signs that there's something extend, extending from your vehicle. It is literally only a few inches off of the side. So if you're going to do this, I would only do it directly off of the back or off of the front. I would never have it hanging off of the side any further than the mirror extends from your car. So what we're gonna wanna do is before we put this trailer hitch mount on, one thing you'll notice if you've ever had a trailer hitch is that there's play, there's wiggle. And so they sell this little, I think it's a $20 bracket by Rhino USA, and it goes on the hitch before you slide it in, and it locks down to prevent this hitch from being able to move and vibrate. It, it, it locks it into place, and there is no play whatsoever. So I'm gonna install this. I wanna make sure that nobody's gonna steal anything. So I also got this locking um, trailer hitch, uh, you know, from, from Rhino USA as well. And then the normal hitch without a ball on it is here. And again, I took a half clamp. I took some thick washers and a locking nut. And I just simply attached it to, to the just standard trailer hitch without a ball. So let's go ahead and install this. Now that we have a place to attach speed rail for our vertical, um, one thing is that you can buy a custom trailer hitch mount. Um, you can buy it from City Mill, Pro Aim, all these different places. You know, they can be quite expensive, hundreds of dollars. For me, you know, as I said, I was trying to go as cheap as possible. And so I got this $20. Uh, half clamp that we used already all throughout the car and just mounted it but the problem I said that you might have with a tow hook is that it might not be uh, perfectly perfectly vertical right so that you might have to have a horizontal speed rail to attach to well that's obviously the case with this uh, and so for me to have a vertical speed rail come off of this once I loosen this up, I now have to have speed rail that comes from a 90 degree swivel clamp here. And similarly to what I said about your connections being 90 degrees, I know that since this is perfectly horizontal, and this is going to go perfectly horizontal vertically, I know that I'm going to want this joint to be locked. And so I went ahead and I put pins in and pretty much every joint um, on this vehicle is locked unless it cannot be locked because it's coming off of the, um, the two first uh, rails that we put on and it's coming off at a angle that's not 90 degrees. So when in doubt, and you, when you can, put a pin in so that these don't rotate. That will keep your rig much, much safer. All right, so you'll notice that I have a, another one of these swivel clamps here. And you'll notice that this one spins freely. And you could say, well, you have this here for your vertical. Why? Do you need 
one over here is just for another vertical mounting option. And no, because while I am creating a triangle from the two rails up top to this vertical here, for extra safety and uh, rigidity, we're going to put another piece of rail from this side to, to this vertical. Now I have a triangle here. And that's important because if this clamp fails, which it's it's failed on Jacob's car uh, from Golden Peaks Productions, and I am not throwing Jacob under the bus for, I know I mentioned him twice, I look up to them. And I, I watched every one of their videos to see how did they build their cars. Because they've built like three different camera cars. Right now they're running an arm uh, with, you know, with a moto crayon on top. So they are way, way ahead of, 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 of what I'm doing. But I, you learn from others' mistakes and they had a single connection. And when that connection failed, there was nothing to back it up. So having a second connection here that connects to that vertical, if for some reason this were to fail, this connected up at a different point on the, on the vertical rail would save me. So I'm going to get this vertical rail mounted and then I am going to take a smaller rail and I'm going to connect it to the vertical. Again, this vertical rail, I've already attached these clamps to. You can already attach yours and just have them there. Don't tighten anything all the way down until you're completely done with the build. I have these just because I know where everything goes and it's going to speed up the video. I'm going to put this in this rail just like the other has been cut so that it doesn't extend any further toward the bottom or higher than it needs to. That's just for me as well. It's a cleaner look. Also, I don't want anything going below any further than I have to lower because your exit angle, you know, whenever you're going in and out of places that there's a dip, a driveway, anything. If you have ever towed anything, you know that you can catch whatever is off the rear on any sort of steep incline. So I don't want this rail going any further down than it has to. So just like in, in the past, I'm going to only have a centimeter or so past this clamp before I tighten it down. So I have this shorter piece here that's gonna make our triangle. And like I said, because these aren't coming off at a 90 degree angle, these aren't locked and that's the only reason why. So if I pre-start this so that it is easier for the tube to exit in and out of. So the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to make our triangle between our top rails that we first installed and now this back vertical. Again, it's smarter if I just close this so that I just have to slide it through and I don't have to worry about trying to finagle and close them. This one's already like that. So the main thing that I really want to point out here is just pay attention to your vertical rail to make sure it's not tilting either too far forward, too far back, or too far left and right. And that'll just help with stability um, and it's just a cleaner look. So around here looks pretty good to me. Just going to gently tighten that with about a centimeter, millimeter. <laughs> So this is a perfect, perfect example. If you notice, I wasn't paying attention and I was pulling from there. The only thing that was supporting this rail was this loose clamp. It wasn't actually tightened there. So I just put a little ding in my car. 
it's okay because this car is going to be wrapped in uh, a matte black for camera car use. And it also just kind of sucks that it happened, but it's, it's honestly good because it just shows that I've been doing this. I was careless in that moment. It's always better to have two people doing this. So that side's locked. That side's locked. And so I'm just gonna put my other rail on the other side. I'm gonna check everything to make sure that it's how I want. And then all I have to do is I'm gonna take a crescent wrench and I'm gonna tighten everything down so that it doesn't move at all. So now that we have all of our speed rail connected, I'm gonna make sure that everything is where I want it. And then I'm gonna take the crescent wrench and I'm gonna tighten down each individual joint just to make sure that nothing is going anywhere. And I'm gonna start at one end of the car and I'm gonna work my way around just to make sure I get all of them. And like I said, I leave every single one of these at an off angle. That way I know that it hasn't been torqued to spec. So if you're doing a build that's similar, it's always smart to have one setting for how you want each nut to end up. That way you know that it is torqued to spec. So as I'm going to tighten this down, you'll notice this one is at a 90 degree, but I didn't rotate it enough. So I'm gonna back off that clamp. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wanna twist the clamp, this clamp, so that it applies pressure on the joint. I can do it either way. So I'm just gonna choose whatever way. I feel like it's easier if I just hold my thumb and sort of twist it this way. And now, no play at all. And you, that's, that's the only negative about using the truss clamps. Much cheaper, there's ways to work around it, not ideal. You notice when I shake, the whole car moves none of the rails do and i'm only halfway through that's a good strong structure it's a good base that that trailer hitch doesn't make noise nothing makes noise and that's the goal so during my walk around I, I'm, I'm grabbing and i'm shaking and i'm moving everything i'm grabbing each individual rail and i'm i'm shaking it because i want to see am i hearing a noise if i hear a noise that means that when i'm driving down the road and I'm hitting road bumps, I'm gonna hear that noise. And that this isn't as properly tightened as it can be. And that's because I'm using these, these clamps as I said. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna to have to crank harder on those joints to make sure they don't rattle. This thing is fully secure. All I have left to do is the whole reason you're here, right? Put the arm on the car, get the camera on, let's go. Again, if you're setting this up for the first time, it's much easier having a second person. Uh, the arm that we're putting on is the Pro-Aim V530. Now, there are much more expensive lenses. Industry standard is the black uh, arm by Flow Cine. The next one down is the, uh, the Easy Raptor. Um, and then Pro-Aim is the cheapest below that one. And then you get into Tilta. Now, I wanted something more robust than the Tilta system, but I wasn't ready to invest, you know, 8,000 plus in the, in the black arm because I wasn't sure if I was gonna like this. And then going from there, you can go into an arm car that's motorized for 25,000 plus. So, uh, I've used this. It's, it's done me well so far, just flying uh, an FX3 with a 24 to 105, a couple V mounts, and the DJI RS2. Um, but this is what gets rid of all of the camera shake, all of the imperfections of the road. And it just mounts right here 
to the speed rail. So the main thing when you're attaching the arm is you're going to want to consider a couple things. This arm, when it has the correct amount of weight on it, should sit fully perpendicular, very like horizontal to the road. It should sit to where this center spring is, 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 is boom, horizontal. That way, whenever it encounters any rough uh, road and it goes down and up and it compresses going down and up, it is not only giving uh, enough space just to one side, right? So when it sits like this and you mount your gimbal and your camera, the one thing to consider is that when it goes all the way down, how high is your camera off the ground because the last thing you want to do is mount this and not consider that and then you hit a big bump and this arm compresses all the way down and your camera or gimbal takes an impact to the road and so you can see i've only barely hand tightened this and it is already very secure um, i will really uh, knuckle it down and then we will go ahead and install the uh, gimbal. All right, so you're going to notice in my hand I have lots of different things. And that's because if you're flying a light setup like the FX3 and the RS2, the arms, uh, especially like this one, uh, just wants a bit more weight to properly stabilize it. This arm in particular has a cheese plate at the top here. I bought a couple... Tilta uh, V mount plates that I can just take a V mount battery and slide it into. And I got one for each side just to balance it out. And I use this to power the gimbal. So one on each side. The, uh, uh, the arm itself comes with a wire isolator. So the arm here gets rid of the big bounces, right? The isolator is what gets rid of the, the, the vibrations. And the one that comes with it is, is great. I just wanted to upgrade because I've heard that when you're running these smaller packages, they can be more susceptible to vibrations and that getting one with the rubber rings um, has a, a greater dampening effect on those vibrations. Um, it, it is a bit more money. It, it is also made by, by Pro-Aim. Um, but that is what your gimbal attaches to. And it comes with a quick release plate for the DJI uh, Ronin 2. I'm flying the RS2, so I had to get just an adapter plate. And um, what I did was I got the DJI uh, RS2 or like the Ronin expansion base kit. And what that does is it allows you to, to attach your, your traditional Ronin gimbal, your RS2, um, to this little plate here that has a couple power inputs. And what it also has is it has a locking hub here. And so this is super important because if something were to happen with the connection, because the normal connection of a DJI RS2 is solely right here in this little this little nut. This attaches over the rosette point and it screws into the base. That way you know that your connection is secure. So if I take this and I put it in the quick release plate and then I lock it down, I can now take my FX3 slide it on. And one of the key things for flying the RS2 or the RS3 Pro is GPS. 
and it doesn't come built in. If you get the bigger DJI, DJI run into the very expensive gimbal, it's built in. Where, why this matters is because for hard acceleration, deceleration, cornering, where the gimbal wants to lose horizon, the GPS understands that data and prevents it. Without that, it just, the horizon goes off and it, it's, it's moving at too fast of a speed for the gimbal to uh, calculate for. And so the issue is that the GPS module itself isn't that hard to come by. It's the little connector piece that is actually hard to come by. I actually had to go on to, uh, I think it's AliExpress and order it from China. DJI has been out of stock for it, of it forever. B&H, every single place in the country. I looked on so many sites um, and I only found it, I think it was AliExpress. Um, and without it, you can get some smooth shots, but if you are cornering, if you are accelerating or decelerating, you may have slight imperfections in the gimbal that you wouldn't have if you had this unit. The only other downside is that it does take up the center USB-C port on the RS2, meaning that you are actually limited by how many focus motors you can put on this because it has to take the center port. And I also bought a DTAP to Limo to power the RS2. The expansion base kit does come with a cable that allows you to plug it in and into the stock handle that comes with the RS2 or the RS3 and you can just have it in your car. However, because I was going to add this weight and I wanted to add this weight, buying this off of Amazon made this much easier. I've run this setup for a few days now and the V-mount battery still has four bars out of four. So it, it, it barely uses up any juice and this just makes it look a little cooler. Once you have your camera attached and everything that's going to possibly go on it, you have all the weight that you need. If this, when it ships, this thing ships to where it is fully, I forget if it's flat or if it's up at an angle. And what that does is you, you need to take a provided wrench and adjust this, which adjusts the spring until it gets to this point. Once you get this level like it is, the next thing are, is the dampening here. And these are like bicycle shocks, right? And what it's doing is this head, you see how this swings out? When you extend it at its fullest point and you let go, you want it to rebound in under three seconds. You don't want it to be so stiff that it's just like snaps right back, but you want it to rebound within two to three seconds. One, two and it's done. Then it also has the side to side and you want this to rebound at the same speed that it did the first time. So if I do this and I put it all the way to the side, it's one, two, three. Lastly is this shock here, which goes along with the springs. So the springs are what gets this arm level, but the shock is what makes it rebound in that two to three second range. So if I push it all the way down and I let go, one, two, three. So that all happened at the same time. If those aren't within the parameters, there's a dial on each one of these uh, mechanisms that you can increase or decrease how much it rebounds or how quickly, right? So once you dial it in and they are all the same, you should be able to push this arm all the way down, lift this all the way forward and then all the way to the side. And then when you let go, one, two, three, they should all come to a stop at the same time within that two to three second range. And so that's how you know that this is set up properly. That way, when you're going on the road and hitting bumps, you know that you're not putting any 
um, more wear and tear on the gimbal than needs to be there. So once this is set up, the last thing that we have to do is connect the camera system and the gimbal uh, to the inside of the car so that we can remotely operate it safely. And there's many different ways to do that. Um, there's wireless and then there's also wired. The one thing about wireless is because you're going through a metal ve vehicle is that you can get interference. And if you have a, a uh, shot that you're doing and you get just a second of interference between your hand controller and the gimbal, it can mess up that shot because you can have a nice smooth pan. It cuts out for just a half second. The pan stops and then it catches back up and it's jerky. You, you just lost that shot. So currently with at least the RS2 and the RS3, because the wireless systems aren't as robust as something like what comes with the DJI Ronin 2, um, I have been running a, a wired system. And that's also been for, for my video feed. I've been running an HDMI off of the camera and it goes, I run it along the arm. Everything's Velcroed together so that it doesn't, um, you know, droop or get caught on anything. And then, then I run it right into the trunk of the car uh, and the trunk just closes on the cables. And then those cables are then rooted into the, either the, the rear passenger seat or the passenger seat so that it can be operated and viewed remotely. Now, one thing I want to note is that I'm using the FX3 and the FX3 can be controlled remotely using a monitor like the port keys. Um, I think it's the LHP52 and that uses Wi-Fi. Well, just like before with our issues with the, uh, the controller dropping signal, because the monitor is in the vehicle, what happens is it was losing signal cutting in and out for control of the monitor or for control of the camera. And so I saw somebody else that was running a similar setup. And what they did was they took just a Wi-Fi extend, extension cable for like $10 on Amazon. And because you already have the HDMI running, you just run that Wi-Fi extension cable. So you remove the, the antenna that's on the port keys monitor, plug in the, in the cable, just run it along. And then I have it to where the other end of the cable ends right here. And I just put the antenna on, on that end. And now there's only a foot distance between the uh, antenna and the FX3. And I've had perfect connections, zero dropouts, zero issues. I can control the iris, the uh, zoom, like, well, the zoom, if it's a, a PZ lens, the white balance, start, stop recording, shutter speed, frame rate, all that through the port keys monitor. If you're using a dis different system, uh, there's other ways to do it. You can also use uh, the the Monitor Plus app for Sony cameras. There, there's there's all different ways. But for me, using an FX3, having the port keys monitor, and it's also really great because you can use touch to focus. So the last two things that are vitally important to this build are these two little cables right here. Um, and, and this is just a safety cable for backup in case of a failure. And, and that's the whole point of this build is that we are trying to prevent failure from happening. And so having backups is always a really, really, really important part of that. I'm going to take the thicker safety cable that I have right here and I'm going to put it through this lower arm here. And then I'm gonna come up through my connections here. And all this is doing is this is allowing, if these clamps here were to fail and this arm were to drop, this safety cable would be held on up here and it would prevent it from hitting the ground. Same thing with right here. If this connection from the gimbal to here were to break, we're gonna take this hard mount, we're gonna wrap it through,
I feed it through the metal parts. And all that does is ensure that if this were to break and fall, that this safety cable is not going to allow it to hit the road. So multiple points of security should something fail. And it's imperative if you're going to be operating on public roadways. Obviously, we just did the exterior of the car. I don't want this video to be any longer than it needs to be. So check out part two, where we're going to show you how we wire and run everything inside the car and how we are able to remotely operate this from inside the vehicle, um, the rigging that's involved with that. And uh, if you have any questions on your next camera car, please reach out to me. Please follow people like Golden Peaks Productions, uh, Faster Media, Cine Milled. There are great people that are already doing this around the country. And like I said, the most important part about all this is, is safety. And, and you don't want to go out half-assing something because you are putting not only other people's lives at risk, but you're putting your future um, if something bad were to happen and you were uh, negligent in, in your actions. So let's have some fun. Let's make some fun stuff. And I'll see you in the next one.